Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, ladies and, and gentlemen. This is uh, indeed, I think it's a, it's a topic that has garnered a lot of uh, in attention and enthusiasm in recent years. I have to say, though, it, it's a bit, um, it's kind of like one of those trends in medicine or maybe in, in life in general where uh, people banty around the term, but it's not entirely clear that we're all talking about the same thing. Uh, and so what I, what I wanted to address my remarks on was sort of what I think precision medicine is uh, in the, the, the setting of, uh, of critical care. Uh, my disclosures are there. I'm not going to speak about uh, any of the products these companies make. So first of all, why is acute care or critical care different from other uh, fields of medicine, other areas uh, where, um, where precision medicine may be, uh, may be practiced? Uh, well, one of the reasons, of course, is that the relationship between the environment uh, and the genetic uh, components of disease, which, of course, determine the phenotype, uh, this relationship, this ratio, this, this trade-off of genetics and environment is very much balanced in favor of the environment more than the underlying genetics with regard to the phenotype that we, uh, that we exhibit. Said another way, it almost doesn't matter if you get hit by a train what your genes look like in terms of the phenotype that you will exhibit. Now, although that's true, there are many aspects of critical illness which genetics are fundamentally important. Uh, the acute disease phenotype is clearly determined in addition to the environment by the underlying health status and diagnosis of the patient, which of course may be influenced uh, by genetic determinants. Functional reserve, or the opposite, being frailty, appears to be genetically determined as well as determined by the environment. The capacity for recovery, which is something that's garnered a lot of attention recently, may be influenced by uh, genetics. And of course, the response to interventions, including pharmacogenomics, which uh, alters the way in which people respond uh, to various uh, pharmacologic therapies. All of these things, of course, are influenced uh, by, uh, by your genes. The acute phenotype certainly is determined more by environment uh, than by heredity. However, there are many other differences in the acute phenotype. Uh, first of all, we don't really have diseases as much in the acute space as we do syndromes. We talk about shock. We talk about organ uh, injury, including acute kidney injury, but also acute lung injury uh, and other forms of acute organ dysfunction. We talk about delirium. We talk about sepsis. These are all syndromes more than, than underlying diseases. The physiology is also more important than the genetics, but we can get at that by thinking about uh, the data that comes off of the machines that we use, the monitors, the ventilators, the dialysis machines, all of these are rich platforms for data that we can use to phenotype our patients. Lab results, including many of the metadata that is simply thrown away from our lab data, it turns out that there's a robust opportunity here for research in this space. For example, the, the RDW, the, the uh, red blood cell uh, distribution width, is a profound determinant or, or associated with, uh, with survival, probably in critical illness, probably because as your endothelium becomes dysfunctional and you get increased shear stress, there's a effect on the uh, red cell distribution width. Uh, so uh, when was the last time you looked at a red cell distribution with? Probably not since medical school, unless you're a hematologist. Uh, and yet it may be an important indicator of illness. The medications the patients are on, which of course are many, many, uh, and are recorded uh, in, the, uh, in, in the chart. Consider some examples. So if you think about shock, um, we, understand, we know that catecholamine-resistant shock, the way it was defined, for example, uh, in uh, recent trials of, uh, uh, like the Athos-3 trial, um, has a three- to four-fold increased risk in mortality. So clearly not all shock states have the same uh, outcome, and therefore there's an opportunity to think about subdividing 
uh, shock states uh, in different ways. In sepsis, I'll talk about uh, this idea of, a, of uh, features of macrophage activation syndrome. In acute kidney injury, uh, I'll talk about uh, atypical TTP, and I'll talk about uh, aspects of renal recovery with regard to uh, its potential genetic uh, uh, association. So first of all, let me talk a little bit about sepsis. So um, in, in sepsis, uh, there's been this sense for many years now that the reason that uh, trials have failed in sepsis is that they've considered sepsis the way we used to consider back in the 1940s, cancer. And of course, none of the therapies that were developed for cancer apart from surgical resection uh, are used today for cancer because we don't treat cancer as a single disease. We don't even treat breast cancer as a single disease. We talk about receptor positive, uh, receptor negative, uh, and we have uh, personalized therapy or precision therapy for the type of breast cancer uh, that we have. We don't have anything close to that in sepsis. Uh, this was some work that uh, Hernando Gomez, who will also be speaking, um, uh, uh, spearheaded uh, some years ago, uh, where he did a machine learning algorithm on a large data set of patients with suspected sepsis. And what he found was that the data naturally separated into certain phenotypes or subphenotypes. Um, and these were different in terms of their uh, timing, in terms of their clinical uh, variates, in terms of their uh, fluid uh, and other treatments, uh, and in terms of their outcomes. Some of these clusters looked familiar in the sense that some of them appeared uh, to represent a uh, clinical disease, which is well known in pediatrics, uh, which is called macrovation activation syndrome. We don't talk about it as much in the adult uh, disease uh, uh, world, uh, but children with, for example, with uh, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, develop this sort of cytokine storm, uh, sometimes stimulated by the, by the rheumatoid arthritis, sometimes uh, stimulated uh, by uh, a viral infection, sometimes uh, the result of bacterial sepsis. Um, and so what we did uh, in an analysis of uh, uh, looking at these subgroups is we just tried to understand where these macrovation activation syndrome features uh, were found. And lo and behold, two of these clusters uh, were clearly uh, where the majority of the macrovation activation syndrome features uh, were. And the overall incidence was about 6.4% in, in the ICU data set and about 2.9% in the overall out, outside the ICU uh, data set. This is a bit lower than what's been described in pediatrics, but, but not that much lower. So uh, Joe Carcillo's work uh, has shown that uh, about 11% of patients with sepsis uh, uh, in a pediatric ICU environment uh, have macrovation activation syndrome. But this was responsible for 65% mortality, whereas without, activation mac without macrovage activation syndrome, mortality was uh, less than 5%. We took a look at um, some of the genetic determinants in adults who clearly don't have genetic disease because they've lived to adulthood but to see whether they had any heterozygote uh, conditions for diseases that are associated with macrophage activation syndrome. So what we did is we took the process cohort, uh, 1,300 patients who were uh, treated with uh, either early goal directed therapy or another protocolized uh, resuscitation strategy or uh, standard of care, and we took this population and we said, how many of these patients have elevated ferritin levels as a, as a marker of macrophation activation syndrome? And we found uh, that 36 patients had uh, ferritin levels above 500, which is sort of a, a reasonable cutoff for MAS. And then we wanted to genotype these patients, and we didn't have a lot of resources, so we just took six patients, the top six patients. And these six patients had ferritin levels above 20,000. Um, and we did whole uh, exome sequencing uh, looking for uh, uh, conditions which may be associated with macrophage activation syndrome. And what we found was that six out of six of these adults had a carrier state, a heterozygote state, for a disease known to either be associated with uh, 
uh, macrophage activation syndrome or uh, HLH, which is just another name for uh, macrophage activation syndrome, primary macrophage activation syndrome, or a condition like familial Mediterranean fever uh, or um, HUS, which is known to cause secondary uh, macrophage activation syndrome. Six out of six, some of whom were double positive, meaning that they were, they were, had more than one trait for the disease. So the hypothesis is that perhaps there are, amongst the patients with sepsis, there are individuals who are manifesting a wholly different disease process that is more akin to uh, uh, rheumatologic disease than it is to normal sepsis response. And you know you've seen these patients because they behave very differently than the average patient with sepsis. The patient who's, who has uh, uh, a massive cytokine storm, the 5%, 10% of patients that we see uh, with, uh, with sepsis. AKI may be a similar situation. We know that overall AKI uh, mortality rates are actually now much higher than, uh, not because they've increased, but because other disease processes have decreased. Um, this is the overall mortality associated with sepsis, septic shock, acute lung injury, and cardiogenic shock. Uh, circa 19 or 2015 or so when these data were derived. And this is the kidney injury uh, uh, stage three, uh, or what we might refer to as acute kidney failure. Um, it's, it's appalling, actually, that mortality rates are as high as they are. And it's not just mortality uh, for AKI, as you well know. It's also morbidity and, and length of stay and costs. Uh, in, in some uh, data analysis from uh, our place in 2000 to 2008, the, uh, the, uh, uh, in patients less than 65 years old, uh, the ICU length of stay increased by, uh, by about three days, more than doubling in patients that have, uh, uh, have uh, uh, acute kidney injury. Hospital length of stay, more than doubling as well. In patients above 65, uh, even though the, the length of stay was higher um, uh, in general, the overall effect was uh, similar, about a doubling of, uh, of the ICU length of stay. And of course, mortality is even higher in that population. Of course, this is not just an ICU disease. Uh, AKI occurs in patients outside the ICU as well. And in fact, the overall relative risk of death is actually higher in patients that are less severe, the relative risk uh, attributed to AKI. Of course, when you already have a predicted mortality that gets above 50%, uh, you can just have so much increase with, with AKI. But there are patients in a low-risk group that actually have an even higher relative risk of mortality uh, associated with uh, acute kidney injury. Um, and it seems like there's some things we can do about this. This is some work that we did with sort of a quality improvement uh, exercise at my uh, a hospital. I showed this in the other room uh, moments ago. Uh, but this was, a, this was a, um, a QI project in which we just did a, an electronic alert that was put into the medical record. And all this does is it goes back and it finds all the serum creatinines that the patient had in the last six months. And it generates, does a little bit of analytics, kind of calculates a median, and it throws out certain values that seem to be outliers. And it serves that up as a baseline creatinine so that clinicians can see how much the creatinine changes. And then it monitors the creatinine inside the hospital. So if there's a 0 0.3 change within 48 hours, it flags that as a uh, AKI event. Uh, even though the creatinine may not be abnormal outside the clinical range so that it doesn't even appear to be abnormal in the medical record. Uh, this alone was associated with um, a, a uh, and I say associated because this is not a randomized clinical trial. This was not a, an intervention. This is a before and after design. Um, uh, however, uh, there was no secular trend in mortality for um, the no AKI group, and yet mortality from the AKI group dropped from 10.2% before the intervention to 9.4% and remained stable, even though there was some fluctuation. The overall effect seemed to be sustained in the two years of follow-up. We also had a statistically significant decrease in rates of renal replacement therapy, which I attribute to a beneficial effect of preventing patients that are identified early with acute kidney injury to going on to more severe 
disease that would require renal replacement uh, therapy. And of course, uh, there are a variety of things that uh, we can do if we can identify patients early with acute kidney injury. I just want to focus on a couple of these things from the KDGO guideline. Uh, drugs are obviously very good targets for QI, quality improvement uh, approaches that adverse drug events are very, very, very common. The Institute of Medicine uh, has estimated in the United States that, uh, that the uh, adverse drug events are the number one cause of uh, hospital-associated uh, mortality uh, in the United States. And it's related to both the nephrotoxic drugs that we use, but also failure to um, uh, dose adjust when, uh, when renal dysfunction occurs. Uh, biomarkers may help with this. This is the, uh, the um, uh, signal of uh, Nefercheck around, of TIMP2 IGFBP7 around a um, episode of uh, vancomycin exposure. And you can see that in patients that develop stage 2, 3 AKI, but not for patients that don't develop AKI, there's this uh, uh, steep uh, kinetic of the biomarker signature around the dose of uh, vancomycin. Uh, top drugs at our institution to target would be vancomycin and aminoglycosides. Non-steroidals, although I caution you, overall non-steroidals are extremely well tolerated. Um, and uh, it's really only in the subpopulation of patients that have uh, uh, chronic kidney disease uh, and extreme, extremes, uh, extremely elderly patients that are uh, where non-steroidals are associated with adverse uh, outcomes. Uh, diuretics. Not entirely clear that diuretics are nephrotoxic. They are clearly associated with AKI, but because we use diuretics to treat AKI, uh, it's hard to know what that means exactly. Antibiotics appear to be a big deal, and not just these um, uh, top uh, drugs. In fact, some recent data suggests that pip piperacil and tazobactam uh, is even more strongly associated uh, with uh, AKI than even vancomycin is. Now, it's an association, and the mechanism is unclear, but uh, that same analysis showed that actually uh, make major adverse kidney events at one year were more common in patients that had AKI uh, related to piptazo than for vancomycin. And the combination of piptazo and vanco was dramatically increased uh, the risk. The final thing to talk about uh, is uh, recovery. And I spent uh, uh, some time talking about the phenotype of recovery in the last talk. Let's talk about um, extreme examples. And this is from some work that we've uh, done as part of an R01 uh, where we follow up patients uh, in the outpatient uh, environment. This is just a couple examples that, that, that we've seen. A 68-year-old with baseline uh, creatinine of 1.2 developed stage 3 AKI was discharged alive with a serum creatinine of 1.5. Um, at follow-up at six months, the creatinine had increased to 2.8 and at 12 months, the patient was deceased. Another patient, so that first patient, appeared to recover renal function by hospital discharge, but was already developing evidence of chronic kidney disease uh, at six months. Another patient, a younger patient, 56-year-old, uh, with a baseline serum creatinine of 0 0.8, had stage 3 AKI, was discharged alive, but with a serum creatinine of 2.0, clearly didn't recover renal function. Um, at six months, uh, serum creatinine was back down to 1.3, and at one year, serum creatinine was down to 0 0.9. So here we have two extreme examples. One is a, parent, a patient who appeared to recover but then developed chronic kidney disease anyway, and here's a patient who appeared to not recover who was fully recovered by one year. How, how does that happen? And of course, there's all sorts of opportunities for um, environment to play a role. Like, I don't even know whether this patient had a second event that somehow tipped them over, or this was all attributable to the first AKI. Uh, I don't know whether this patient was treated well relative to this patient. But it's also possible that there are, are candidate genes which may influence uh, recovery. Uh, so there are, are uh, genes that are associated with, uh, with uh, hibernation uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, organ dysfunction, which may be, uh, which may be important uh, in, in, in terms of mitochondria. Uh, there's proliferation uh, uh, genes that uh, appear to be uh, significantly uh, important in terms of, uh, and they have a they have a, a, a an adverse of effects. In other words, people who have these uh, genetic uh, 
um, abnormalities may be more likely to regenerate after injury, but may also develop neoplasms. Um, Fibrosis, uh, which of course is the uh, sort of the maladaptive side of re repair, uh, may be more common in patients with this uh, genetic trait. Uh, and we also have uh, regeneration and, uh, and malignancy uh, with re well too many uh, candidates to, uh, uh, to mention. So uh, in conclusion, there's considerable clinical evidence that uh, uh, severity and recovery uh, after sepsis and AKI may be uh, linked to um, uh, 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 the significant variation may be linked uh, to, um, uh, uh, to, to uh, genetic uh, 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 differences uh, because the variation is poorly explained by exposure, severity, and baseline clinical characteristics. Uh, there are subtypes of diseases like sepsis, which may exist, uh, such as uh, macrophage activation syndrome, uh, and they may be linked to genetic disease. Severe, several mechanisms of injury and repair have been identified, which may be important, uh, and genetic variation appears to be common in this population. And with that, I thank you for your attention.